Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Illinois lawmakers are on break, getting ready for the 11th hour negotiations that could create a state budget plan. And suicide among those in the military. Why our service men and women should not think they're alone. Someone's got their back in the cities. Some of the men and women serving in the military are coming home with scars that few of us can see. We'll talk with a commander with the American Legion about the problem of suicide among veterans and one man who's taking his mission to the streets. But first, Illinois lawmakers facing another cliffhanger end to its session. It's not unusual, actually, for last hour maneuvers to craft a state budget. That happens in almost every state, in almost every session. But never has a state waited for the other guy to blink, quite like Illinois has. And joining us are two of the newest members of the legislature, newly elected Republican State Representative Tony McCombie from Savannah, newly elected Democratic State Representative Mike Halpin from Rock Island. Both of you, thank you so much for joining us. You guys don't seem to be overflowing with a love of the legislature, or at least your experiences in the first session. Uh, Representative McComey, let me ask you that. I mean, what were you expecting and what have you seen so far? Well, I expected the schedule, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> I did not expect how different um, I felt that um, one side would be compared to the other on uh, some of the votes. Uh, I, I feel like we're all typically you know, in, in our positions to do the right thing and, and represent our, our, our folks. And I feel um, sometimes that's led astray. And, and I, so I'm a little disappointed in that piece of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like we really need to be talking about the budget. Um, and I feel that there's been a few gotcha votes that, you know, weren't necessary. But, uh, this has been a thing, as far as the budget is concerned, that it seems like the rank and file members of the legislature are locked out until the very last second when you get to see whatever you're going to vote on an hour, two hours, a day before it actually gets approved. Is that your fear this time? Uh, no, actually. If you look at the Senate, uh, we've got three active proposals. And I believe, you know, sure, I'm not on a committee, and I don't believe Mike is on a committee either to actually sit down and, and jot down the numbers. And to look at the process is pretty difficult, even coming from uh, municipal um, budgeting, which is a much smaller, but the theory is the same. But there are, um, Representative Batnick, he put together a, um, uh, a review of the budget for us to look at. So there's people in the House even that are working on this, and uh, there's a lot of questions that come from that. So I think as long as we're actively asking questions of our, our members, of our leadership, of the Senate side, reaching out, we just have to take the initiative to do that personally. Um, but we're not sitting in a room, you know, like us right here, sitting, you know, putting numbers down on a piece of paper, unfortunately. Representative Halpin, what's your assessment so far of the session? I mean, your first session yeah. down in Springfield. Well, I very much enjoy the job, although I do think it's a, a you know, a challenging time. And uh, as Tony said, uh, I'm not in a room talking about line item numbers uh, or anything like that, but there are constant discussions about what the priorities are and uh, trying to keep up to date with what's happening in the Senate because, you know, the, the Senate really has been a, a bipartisan driver of these discussions, which I'm, which I'm very happy about. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just signals continued movement, uh, continued discussion, and I think it's good for the state. Do you think we should read anything into the fact that uh, Mike Madigan met with the governor last week? I mean, does that mean anything, or was that just more of a photo op or, or a sense of progress? Um, I'm not sure how much to read into it. I do think it is a, a good sign. It's certainly better than having them not having them meet. And the fact that they met one-on-one -on -one, uh, and the fact that there wasn't any staff or press there in the mm -hmm. room uh, is a good sign. And, I, and I, the fact that uh, each was kind of mild in their assessment of, of the other afterward is also a good sign mm -hmm. because that hasn't been the case in the past. Representative McCombie, the one area still so much concern is uh, education, particularly mm -hmm. uh, uh, K through 12 education. Once again, uh, uh, East Moline among the uh, school districts that are really crying for help right now. Uh, what seems to be happening in that area, the brinkmanship is occurring now when school districts are trying to create budgets. Yeah, it's, it's we have to, and I, I said it all along and now I understand um, more about changing our funding formulas. Mm -hmm. You know, the foundation method is not working anymore in the state. 
Uh, and we really have to quit talking about changing the funding formula, the evidence-based model. Uh, there's bills on both the House and on the Senate side. And I, that is the, we have the support of the, of the um, educators to embrace that model. There's, of course, some tweaks that have to be tied to it. And on the Senate side, there's mandate relief and pension reform and different things that are tied to that as well. But it, we have to just quit talking about it. You know, the governor had a task force, and now uh, Speaker Madigan has a task force. And I'm lucky to be on that with several members. So we're learning a lot. The new members are learning a lot about that as well. But we just have to quit talking about it and try it. Uh, it's scary to start something new, uh, but what we have now isn't working. I think I have 16 districts in mine, and one is only uh, fully funded, and that's, that's in Erie. Yeah. Uh, luckily, they're blessed with Cordova. I think um, Mike has eight, like six yeah. or eight. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a problem when we're not, there's too much of a gap in our funding, and we have to figure out how do we get that gap um, closed. What kind of guarantee can you give school districts right now? I mean, what can you tell them about, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I mean, wh what can they expect by the end of the end of the session of May? <laughs> well, they can, ex they can expect me to continue to fight for the evidence-based model. Uh, they can uh, count on me to continue to vote down mandates, whether they make sense or they don't, uh, is, is irrelevant at this point because we're going to have to pay for it. And they need to get caught up on all of the mandates that we continue to put on them. Uh, they also have my commitment to, um, with the evidence-based model, to look at property tax uh, reform so we can not rely so much on that, um, but not take it away from them. Uh, because you, you can't, and that's the thing, I think people think we're going to go ahead and do this new funding formula and our property taxes are going to go down, and I mm -hmm. don't think we can do that because we have to see how it works first. Uh, I think there's some, um, definitely some things that can help with property taxes, and, and uh, both Mike and I voted uh, for Representative Musman's bill for property tax, a, a good start some, to some relief. But in the meantime, we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, Representative Halpin, I mean, let's talk about that, because school districts are so heavily dependent on property taxes. And I mean, we're seeing some of the sales taxes now being used, Rock Island County being the latest county to approve that for some infrastructure construction. But what would you tell superintendents right now that are struggling to come up with a budget? What is the state going to do? Well, we actually had a, a joint meeting also with Representative Swanson just on, uh, on Monday. And w what we did tell them is that these discussions are, are still going on. Uh, I support the, you know, the evidence-based uh, formula, although I would like to see uh, as a trade-off of the state providing more funding that schools are, off, are offering property tax relief. I think that's a deal that as I go door to door and talk to people, that's, that's what the, the residents expect. They need to see that relief if we're going to be spending more money on education. Um, but what I, what I told them is that we're going to continue these discussions. The fact that the K through 12 uh, you know, stopgap budget expires at the end of June is going to be an enormous pressure on us to get a deal done. And uh, temporary or otherwise, I'd prefer, I'd prefer permanent. And that's where I was going to go next is that, I mean, what kind of deal do you think it's going to be realistically? Another stopgap that's the best you can do? Or do you think there's going to be a new grand bargain, a big budget plan? I, I'm new enough to, to say that I don't know. Um, what those pressures are. I haven't experienced that the last flurry of activity in the, past, the last two weeks of session. Uh, it is my, my hope and my, my expectation that we're going to seriously consider a full-time uh, permanent budget. Uh, but I certainly can't promise that as I sit here. Stopgap budget always has a, a, an underlying factor is that it, it decreases the confidence even more, like businesses or people who are thinking of expanding or, or anything like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a, a grand bargain, a, a major budget bill. Absolutely. I, I do not see myself voting for another stopgap, to be quite honest with you. We've tried it. It didn't work. Um, it continues uh, with us not having a, a true budget, um, a balanced budget, which I don't think we've had a true balanced budget in, what, 15 years. Uh, what it does is just what you said. It, it, companies can't plan. Education, the schools can't plan. Uh, people aren't coming here. People aren't expanding here. And we need to show them that, you know, we um, have our act together. And until we do that with a full budget, um, the stopgap's not going to offer any reassurances, in my opinion. It's, it's, it is a temporary, um, I don't even want to say it's a fix. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's very temporary. It's a Band-Aid <laughs> that just gets you through to another couple months. A Band-Aid on an artery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we have to, we have to do this. We have a constitutional responsibility to do it. And the thing is, is that I keep pushing for is just let us, let us vote on it. That's what people don't realize. They're, they're coming toward to us, pass a budget, pass a budget. I'll vote on a budget if I have one that comes across my desk. That's one of the things that's really a challenge 
we don't have control of what we get to see to vote on. Do you have a line in the sand though when it comes to the new budget as far as tax increases are concerned? I mean, does it have to be a mix of revenue enhancement or, or various <laughs> uh, tax uh, increases as well as cuts? I mean, is there something that you would not vote for? Well, I, st I said it during the campaign and I'm not going to vote for any income tax uh, or any tax enhance or revenue enhancements, tax increases, let's just put it out there. I, I don't think we can do that right now. But you know that a bill is going to have something in there. You can't just say, no, I'm not going to vote for that bill. Are you going to say that? Well, you, you can say that. Sure, right. I don't know if I am going to say that. I mean, okay. you're going to have to really look at it, but it's not my um, direction today to um, or for since I started in, in this rat race to uh, vote for a tax increase. I don't think that's our answer. Until we can reform how we're spending our money, how is it fair for me to ask you to, to pay more? It's not fair. Representative Halpin, the same question. I mean, is there a line in the sand? Are there certain cuts that you won't agree to? Is there certain uh, revenue enhancements that you won't agree to? From my perspective, we have to keep talking about everything. And the economists that I talk to uh, you know, they are uniform in their opinion that it's a mix of everything, mix of spending cuts, uh, you know, tax increases, and, and so you have to see specific what's in the package. I certainly don't support any tax that would uh, be increased on, on middle class families, working families, or, or the poor. I've always supported, uh, you know, the, the millionaire surcharge, but the problem with that is that it does take time. Uh, it's going to require a, a constitutional amendment. Uh, but I'm, I keep an open mind. I'll look at every bill. I'm willing to make very difficult decisions uh, so long as I can trust that it's going to fix the problem. I want to touch on some of the social issues as well as in our remaining moments. The minimum wage hike going to $15 has been discussed. Is that something that you think is going to happen and do you support it? I've been a long advocate of raising the minimum wage. The current bill, it's not, I don't think, is in its final form. Mm -hmm. um, what it calls for right now is $15 by 2022. A gradual increase. Correct. And, and I've talked to uh, business owners uh, on both sides of that. Uh, issue. Uh, some are actually, you know, small business that support the 15. Uh, I believe Augustana College is already on path to go to 15. Uh, I'm still discussing with people here in the district, especially since we're on a border community, what's the what's the best approach. Representative McCombie, I mean, is there a magic number or no increase at all that you would support that that's state mandated? I don't. I don't think we can mandate this minimum wage right now. It's it, it's one more thing um, to have businesses not come here, especially small businesses. And as a small business owner, um, I know I'm going to be. I would have to cut hours. I would have to cut employees. Um, how is that going to provide additional services to the folks that are coming into in, using my business? Um, I think you know the things that we can look at to help businesses is not raise the minimum wage, but look at our workers' comp, look at our unemployment tax, look at our property tax. Those are the things that we need to talk about. Um, do I think, um, as an employer, can I offer a higher wage? Yes, I can. And do I? Yes, I do. Um, but that, that's on what I can do and what I can afford. I can tell you over the years my business has drastically changed, uh, so I have lost bodies to be able to continue to pay at a, a, a better wage than minimum. So I think that's something that we need to obviously talk about. We want to be able to pay a fair wage, um, but I don't think right now that that's what our businesses need. House uh, Bill 40, the abortion bill, so to speak, um, um, expands the coverage for women on Medicaid as well as for state workers. Some would call that state-funded uh, abortion. Uh, governor Rauner is promising a veto. Is that something you support the governor with? I, I do. I do. I don't believe it's a, a social bill. I believe it's a, a, a fiscal bill. Uh, whether it's a, um, whether you feel it's morally uh, a moral bill, there was I think three people that I feel really talked about the bill itself, and mm -hmm. that was Representative Bellock, uh, uh, Drury, and um, Batnick. And it's it is not the responsibility of the state to pay for um, an abortion. I just don't feel that way. Representative Halpin, I mean, this is something that Democrats uh, strongly support. Uh, I saw it as a, as a fairness issue. Um, your your health choices and your reproductive health choices shouldn't be determined by how much money you make. And what this bill does is is it evens that um, that ability to seek that uh, that care. And even if you're a low income individual, the other area was uh, marijuana, of course. And so many people are looking at uh, cannabis oils and various forms of marijuana for medical uses. But now we've gotten into that area that almost the flood door. Once you once you approve that, then we talk about the legalization of marijuana. I know a lot of people in the legislature for Illinois want to see what other states do. Representative McCombie, is that something that is there a line in the sand there that uh, medical marijuana perhaps is one thing, legalizing marijuana is quite another? 
No, I don't have a line in the sand either on that on that issue. I think the the medical marijuana is still fairly new, so I think we need to continue to watch that and monitor to that. And I think there's fixes in that process that we can do. I think we also need to watch other states and how it's working or not working for them, um, because for us to medical marijuana, medical no recreation, for recreational. Yeah, okay. I think we need to watch that too. Mm -hmm. um, the medical is already here, so you know we can just tweak that now. But for the the recreational, we need to see what the other states are doing and how it's working or it's not working. I think that's a, an important piece. A lot of people, you know. Not a lot, but several have said, you know, that'll solve all the state's problems. I disagree with that. As far as taxation is concerned, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I disagree. It's, it's, and we've seen the black market actually uh, be more active, I guess, in Colorado. We've heard of that. And it's, it's, it's not a, a silver bullet. You know, you had asked me about this, Jim, last year during the campaign. At that time, the feedback I was getting from the public was that we weren't ready for it. But since um, the bill was introduced in this session, I've taken upon myself as I go door to door and as I'm talking to individuals at various meetings, and I, I think there is a uh, there's a, a drift in in support of it. And so I'm, I, my commitment to people has been to keep an open mind on it. Uh, cer certainly would not rule it out, uh, but I encourage everyone to, to contact my office. Let me know what they think. Representative Mike Halpin, Representative Tony McCombie, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we we hope us. that you enjoy your next uh, two months as far as the legislature is concerned with, of course, the hope that a lot gets accomplished, too. Mm -hmm. The countdown to the end of school is in high gear right now, and the countdown to summer has begun as well. But there's still a lot of events scheduled before the heat of June arrives. Here's Laura Adams, out and about. This is Out and About for May 1st through 7th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Quad Cities Beer Week kicks off at the River House in Moline. Every day, a new beer and a new brewery. While Tour de Brew, QC, raising money for charity, is a fun-filled bicycle ride along the Mississippi with stops at some great Quad Cities breweries on May 6th. QC Paws is holding a kitten shower at the Rock Island County Animal Care and Control on May 6th. And the Hillsdale Firefighters Association is hosting their annual pancake breakfast May 7th. The Geneseo Kiwanis hold their spring chicken fest at the Moose Lodge. And the German American Heritage Center is bringing classic Beatles, Westphalia vans, kit cars, and more to downtown Davenport. Village in Bloom, a festival of the arts, is in the village of East Davenport and kicks off May 6th while the Downtown Rock Island Arts and Entertainment District and Mid-Coast Fine Arts present Gallery Hop May 5th. The Central Congregational Church in Galesburg presents Brahms Requiem May 6th, while Circa 21's family-friendly musicals The Music Man and Big Nate continue to delight audiences at the Downtown Rock Island Theater. Suzical the Musical is presented at Rock Island High School May 4th through 6th, and Timberlake Playhouse in Mount Carroll starts their 2017 season with the musical Pump Boys and Dinettes. Finally, Richmond Hills Players is holding auditions for their next show on March 6th and 7th at the Barn Theater in Geneseo. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Well, the numbers can be debated, but the reality is still all too shocking. America's military men and women are at a higher risk of suicide. The American Legion has a suicide hotline, which we'll show you on the bottom of the screen tonight. It's just one example of how veteran groups really want to lend a helping hand for those who are suffering wounds that few of us can see. Joining us is Sherry Stanton, the Illinois Department Commander for the American Legion. Rick Schomer, who's the organizer of the upcoming Awareness Walk 22. It's coming up Saturday, May 13th in Milan. Just to get that phone number out right away, the Veterans Crisis Line is 800-273-8255. And once again, you'll see that on the bottom of the screen during this interview. Thank you both for joining us, and I appreciate it. It's let, our honor. Let us talk about uh, uh, veteran suicide. I, I, like I said, the numbers can be confusing. Some people say 22 veterans die a, a, a day. Others say that that number isn't quite right. But let me ask you about the fact that the number of suicides in the veterans population is much bigger than in the civilian population. Oh yes, oh yes. We have, uh, they just have an average, I guess over the last few years, of 22 veterans every day. And that's all age levels, that's just not just our current veterans, that's all age levels that commit suicide. And here's, uh, here's the thing, uh, that when the first, when the, during the first survey, the, what the VA done is they only took the 20 states. Right. They didn't take all 50 states. And, and, and the survey was, you know, limited. Mm -hmm. And I really don't right. want to get into the numbers because I understand okay. the whole thing. But the key right. is the impact and the reality of how many suicides that, that are occurring. And, and what made you really want to get involved in bringing this to light? As a retired Marine, I became involved because I worked with the VA and worked for the VA. 
So, and my job description was to support the homeless veterans population in the Quad Cities as well as the surrounding communities in Iowa City. Uh, I just carried that out of, into retirement. Um, I'm kind of like uh, in, a, in, a, in a point where I believe that 22, 20 plus veterans, the VA released that 20 veterans per day are committing suicide. It was 22 for a long time. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody understands this. I believe personally that it could be higher, okay? We as a Legion family support the number that the VA has given us, and it's mm -hmm. 20 right now per day. One is way too many. That's exactly it, and, 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 I, and I ask you, Commander, what is the research? I mean, I understand PTSD. I understand, you know, the, the, the things that you see in war, the things that you see on the front line are devastating to your psyche. But what can we do to decrease that number? What can we do to help? I think a lot of veterans, they just hold it inside and they don't get out and they don't talk to people. And we have uh, people that are trained to uh, communicate with the veterans then uh, talk over things and help them understand that it's just not, uh, well, that they it's can get it out. It's not a sign of yeah. weakness. Yes, and I think that's, not, that's kinda, the and, thing. Yeah, and when you think of military men and women, a sign of weakness is the last thing that they want to uh, show. And I think there's more women that are suffering out there, but they don't let it out. They keep it in, and it just blows up that way. American Legion, of course, has the hotline. What, what else are you trying to do? What kind of outreach is important to uh, make sure that we are able to at least recognize the problem, if not better find a solution? Well, we have a lot of counselors that are available through the DVA and, and the And we also the go VA. visit the VA mm -hmm. hospitals, the mm -hmm. VA clinics. You know, we, we make our, uh, we make it for sure at those locations to talk to the veterans and to talk to the staff. And we also open the door up and uh, let them know that they can, they can call us pretty much for anything, any question that they might have. The women veterans are the most, I don't know if I should, you know, suicidal. The, the numbers have went up in, in the women's veterans. I think it's, it's well over 85% now. Number of female veterans are two to five times higher than their civilian counterparts. Yes. Two to five times higher mm -hmm. than people yes. not in the military. I mean, that's, that's an astounding right. and, number. And just so that you know, 19% of the military, the armed forces now, are female. So that's, that's quite a bit. So what, what, I mean, you say you go to the VA, I mean, yeah. you're seeing people that probably are already seeing treatment. How do you get to the people that aren't at the VA, those people who aren't actually looking for treatment and actually are, are kind of hiding the symptoms as right. best they can? Right, well, we have a, a group in this area, particularly in Alito, uh, the Adonai- uh, Amy Hess. Amy Hess, and uh, she works with counseling, and sometimes some of the veterans will come in and say, you know, I, I just, I'm out of money, I don't have enough money for the rest of the month, and my kids need cereal or whatever, and she works with different groups that help support that. She's got some furniture uh, available if mm -hmm. they need some furniture for filling out their houses or whatever, if, they're, if they've got the kids with them, and it's just, an ongoing process that she's been doing. She volunteers to do this. She helps a lot of veterans out of her own pocket. And uh, she also, she got recognition mm -hmm. last year from the state, said mm -hmm. we can't give you any money, but right. we want to recognize that you're doing such a good job. Because it's important to have a safety net. And, and Rick, I kind of want to underline that is that uh, military families are under stress. A, a yes. Veterans families are under stress. It's not yes. just suicide. I mean, we see domestic abuse cases that yes. are increasing, that there's certain types of violence. First Army has a program, Arsenal Island has uh, uh, outreach mm -hmm. programs, and, and, and that seems to be critically important, once again, to at least shed light on the problem. And also about employment. I think employment plays a major role in health and mental health issues within veterans. If you're not employed or satisfactorily employed, I believe that it really adds stress to him, her, and the family. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we can get a lot more involvement with our within our veterans and 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 truly see their potentials and their uh, uh, their experience, you know, and and get them employed, 
I believe that the stress levels will go way down, and I also believe that maybe this 20 plus veterans a day committing suicide would also decrease. Okay, Rick, the Awareness Walk 22, Saturday, yes. May 13th in yes. Milan. This is the second year that you've done it? Second year. Second year that you've done it. Who takes part in the walk and where do the proceeds go? Uh, the community. Community takes place in uh, part in the walk. Uh, the proceeds will go to uh, the disaster relief uh, national. Half of it will go to yes. the des disaster relief. It gets kind of like last year we decided to give it all to Amy Hess, the director of Anana, mm -hmm. and she uh, made sure that all the money was actually uh, given to the veterans that really needed the support mentally and physically and uh, health wise. And then uh, this year we decided to go ahead and give her half and then give the National Disaster Relief for the state of Illinois for the American Legion. That way, for example, um, if we have to deploy for a flood, a, uh, a tornado, severe weather of any sort that damaged the home or... Um, when it's totally devastated, mm -hmm. the home is totally devastated, the American Legion after the first responders come yeah. in. The American Legion comes in and says, you know, you are an American Legion member, you're a paid up American Legion member, right. so we want to help you out. And you fill out these papers, and usually within a 24 hour to 48 hour time limit, you get a $3,000 check. Thank you, paid. And uh, it gets you tied over to Absolutely. get you food and clothing and, and places to stay while you're waiting for your insurance. And to that actually in. decreases the level of stress on that veteran and their family to where maybe if he or she was contemplating after the disaster, right. they're no longer doing that. Get rid of a little of that stress. Yes, that's correct. Department Commander Sherry Sandin, thank, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us. Rick, good to have you here. Thank Awareness you Walk much. 22, once again, it's coming up Saturday, May 13th in Milan. And a reminder, the American Legion Veterans Crisis Hotline is available 24-7. The number, as you can see on the screen, 1-800-273-8255. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military. And the Arsenal Clubhouse is getting ready for a Mother's Day champagne brunch buffet. The clubhouse has a full brunch plan, complete with a complimentary champagne and mimosa bar. Public is invited, but reservations are needed with a brunch starting at 1030 and lasting until 2. And mark your calendars for the 2017 America's Armed Forces Kids Run. It's coming up May 20th. This is also open to the public. There's a two-mile run for kids 9 to 13 years old, a one mile run for kids who are seven and eight, a half mile run for five and six year olds, and a 100 yard dash for three and four year olds. The races start at nine. There's also a family fun zone set up after the races. And we'd like to congratulate some kids of our own. The judges have spoken and we have the top winners in the WQPT writing contest. 16 children from kindergarten through third grade are winners and will be honored for their stories at the Dear Wyman House later this month. The kindergarten winner, winner that is, is Xander Rowland of Rock Island. Lily Daly of Davenport won first place in the first grade category. In second grade, the winner is Willa Hathill of Bettendorf. And our third grade winner is Shalini Chandupatla of Bettendorf. Their work will be on display at the Butterworth Center this month and the Figgy Museum and Bettendorf Family Museum next month. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.